Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking some time to join us today at HR Net Group's Company Spotlight. So my name is Fazlin, and I head up the corporate communications team here. With me today, I've got our group CFO and executive director, Jennifer, uh, who will be sharing with you some information about our group. So over to you, Jennifer. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us on a Saturday morning. HR Net Group is a Singapore company which is one of the leading players in the Asian recruitment market. We operate in 17 Asian cities across nine geographies, including Singapore, where we have Mian City as our head office, mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan, South Korea, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. We operate 15 recruitment brands and employ about 1,000 people. About 80% of that are consultants that help organizations find talents and every year, between 50 to 60,000 people get jobs through us. We are now in the blackout period as our first half 2024 results is scheduled for release after trading hours on the 12th of August. So today's presentation contains some update of non-price sensitive information. And for those of you who want to recap some of the facts and figures, you can refer to the deck that was published on the 2nd of May. I'll move on to the slides popper. HR Net Group as a stock has been bringing progressive returns to shareholders. In the last six years, our ROE has been between 15 to 19%. We generated a cumulative net profit after tax of $365 million and distributed $201 million as dividends, which is around 55% average dividend payout. We have also returned $28 million through share buyback. Since three years ago, we started twice a year dividend payout, interim and final, and we fully intend to keep the progressive trend. We started our $30 million share buyback plan back in mid-2022 and now have a balance of about $11.6 million to resume share buyback after our results render announcement. HRNet Group closed the challenging year of 2023 with $578.5 million of revenue and net profit after tax of $66.1 million. Our profit margin of 11.4% is higher than most of our international peers. Whilst these numbers are respectable in the face of the challenging times that we were in, we strive to do better. Back in 2018, we reported revenue of $428.5 million. And in 2022, a new high was recorded, right in the middle of COVID. 2023 revenues easily topped pre-COVID revenues, and we saw a similar phenomenon for profits. Net profit after tax for 2018 was at $52.4 million, reaching $66.1 million in 2023. As was the case in previous crises, we have leveled up and forged ahead each round. We have two key business segments, flexible staffing and professional recruitment. Professional recruitment is a 99% GP margin business, while flexible staffing revenues include payments due to our contractors for their work and has about 15% GP margin. The common denominator of flexible staffing and professional recruitment is GP. Last six years, flexible staffing GP has been ramping up while professional recruitment saw reductions in the last three years. This is a reflection of how we have been evolving with market shifts during volatile and uncertain times. From the demand side, clients turn to flexible staffing for flexibility to access manpower on demand and pay us to source and carry the headcount, payroll, and employer responsibilities. From the supply side, the workforce has also adjusted to short-term assignments or going on contract basis and as an acceptable and normal mode of working. From a business standpoint, flexible staffing is recurring in nature and largely counter-cyclical. This is a good hedge for our business in those economies that remain uncertain as they tend to skew towards flexible staffing. As such, the proportion of flexible staffing GP moved from 33% in 2018 to 50% in 2023. 
Based on this change in business mix, our blended GP margin shifted from 36% to 24%. Amidst the geopolitical tensions, we do the fine balancing and diversification of revenues and GP between Singapore and North Asia. Singapore and mainland China are navigating a turbulent patch, whereas Chinese Taipei and Indonesia are brighter. Singapore's economy is so open that any time there are wars going on in the world, tension, uncertainty, we feel it. But fundamentally, we believe both countries will emerge out of this cloud. It is a matter of time, and we are positioning ourselves for the recovery. At the crux of it, we are a people business. For us, the most impactful part of ESG is actually the S, our social contribution to society. In 2023, we generated economic value of $606 million, which was predominantly revenue. And then we had $584 million distributed amongst various stakeholders, including our shareholders, vendors, government, and the largest beneficiary that received 84% of the distribution are our contractors and employees. The intrinsic value of our people business is not just in dollars and cents, but the very livelihood of real people, and more and more of them over the years, as many as nearly 54,000 people last year were impacted by jobs as our employees, our contractors, and the candidates that we placed. We are indeed in a very meaningful business. Over the last six years, we have added five organic businesses, acquired five businesses and co-invested in three combo units to bring us to 37 business units, expanded from nine to 15 brands and grown our network from 10 Asian cities to 17. We think of it as having three engines for growth, organic setups, inorganic acquisitions and combos which are really the startup of new ventures with our inorganic co-owners. In this way, over the last six years, we have seen the organic startups of brands like Recruit First in Taipei, Kaohsiung, Xinzhu, and Seoul, as well as HR Net One brand in Shenzhen, the acquisition of Optimate, Centerpoint Personnel, Reforce, and the recently announced semiconductor-focused Always HRNet. And combos like Recruit First Indonesia, Optimate Staffing Singapore. We often asked, get asked a question as to what are the hot sectors or industries that we deal with? And this is what we call the pockets of growth, which our recruiters or our consultants will be working on even before you see it in the news. In 2018, there was banking. Everyone wanted their son son or daughter to be a banker. In 2019, the flavor of the month was right hailing. Uber, Grab, Gojek were taking the world by storm. By 2020, the hot industry was safe distancing. We were deploying safe distancing ambassadors across web markets in Hong Kong and pretty much everywhere in Singapore. 2021 was the year for vaccinations, which spilled over into 2022, sharing space with the very hot semicon industry. And in 2023, retail and consumer sectors rose because of the return of travel and tourism. Generative AI became the buzzword. We did a fair bit of placements of data scientists, machine learning and computer vision engineers since last year. 2024, the hottest topic got to be AI, robotics, and Semicon is back again. Our business is run by co-owners. At IPO in 2017, we had 20 of them. Today, through our organic startups and acquisitions, we have a total of 44 passionate 
and enterprising co-owners at the heart of the business. Our people take a long-term view as they run this business as owners. Every year, there are dividends declared, and at retirement, a valuation of the business is done so that they can sell the stakes to the holding company. Pivoting is indeed our strength and is in large part due to our culture. It makes a real difference to agility and whether you go to sleep at night thinking about the business and waking up in the morning doing the same. We just keep rallying more and more co-owners to run with us. Early this year, we acquired 51% of a recruitment firm in Shanghai that specializes in semiconductor search. This is a business that has been around for 15 years. All the four co-owners being engineers, they speak the lingo and they work on technical positions, especially FAPs, which not many recruitment firms in China have that expertise. Activities are certainly picking up as we focus on upskilling our newest team members and ramping up on hiring for this sector that is getting a lot of Chinese government support. Next, I will go into what we want to be and what we are working towards. We want to build up and capitalize on our regional platform. This is an advantage we have over many small players in the market. Clients and candidates who work with us know that we deliver a consistent and quality product across 17 cities, a tech-enabled experience that just keeps getting better over time. We want to be uh, building up the verticals, extending our range of offerings, particularly those with recurring revenue stream, so that we own 80 cents of every HR dollar. Anytime there is a talent-related need, we want you to think of HRNet Group. You are assured of our quality, you know we are good for our money, and you are certain we will deliver. We also hunt as a pack. Any one of our businesses can connect you across geographies and verticals. There is great strength in numbers for cross-fertilization. Through the three engines for growth, organic startups, inorganic acquisitions, and combos, capitalizing on our regional platform and owning 80 cents of every HR dollar. Our board comprises four executive directors and five independent directors. Most of us are veterans in the recruitment industry. We take a long-term view and global view towards organization and reputation building. Besides our Singaporean founder and the executive team, you see independent directors like Heng Sato, who is CFO of one of the top flexible staffing firms listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. You see Wallace Gao, who is the founder of Beijing Career International listed on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. And you see Albert Ellis, who is CEO of one of the largest UK blue collar staffing companies listed on the London Stock Exchange. We believe in corporate longevity and health spend. We are in the select group of companies which made it past 30 years. We want to be in the 0.5% of companies which make it past 100. We keep ourselves very lean and agile. We collect data and we constantly analyze how to refine our processes and operations, how to reach 120% occupancy of our office space, how to increase the conversion rates of the cases that we work on, and we persistently keep a $300 million cash pile as we want to be ever ready to ride out any storm, capitalize on any opportunities to grow, and never to be at the mercy of bankers and friends. We don't just work here. We own this company and we are committed to growing it so that it flourishes and prospers for many generations to come. On behalf of our board, Thank you very much for joining us on this journey. 
Okay, thank you so much, Jennifer. I think um, the insights that Jennifer has shared has clearly given some color to um, how we're performing as a group. So um, I think uh, we have some time and we're more than happy to take uh, questions uh, from from you. So um, do type in your questions into the chat and we'll answer them as they come along. Um, let's, uh, maybe Jennifer will just wait for a moment for the questions to stream in, yeah? Yes. I see a very interesting question. Okay, yeah. <laughs> And I'll start it off. Uh, what is the current market like for the recruitment business? Um, I think in the last couple of weeks, some of our UK recruitment players have just released their trading updates for quarter two, 2024. Um, companies like Hayes, Page, Robert Walters, S3 have all reported declining GP for both flexible staffing and professional recruitment. And we note that they, their flexible staffing is falling less than professional recruitment. Indeed, the global headwinds are affecting most recruitment firms in the world right now. And I don't think we are bucking the global trends. Um, given the volatile economic climate, it is not just our corporate clients that are cautious about spending. Our candidates are also careful about changing to a new environment. And what we're seeing in the, our three largest markets, we've got Singapore, Taiwan, and mainland China. I'll just give you some color on that. Now, the Singapore market continues to be tough for recruitment. Um, banking and tech are up, but consumer and retail are soft. It is said that um, our stronger Sing dollar, pricier goods and services, and the resumption of travel plans post-pandemic have contributed to a growing number of um, locals preferring to spend more overseas. And uh, of late, we hear a lot of Singaporeans um, in Japan. Most Singapore retailers are reporting a negative performance in May compared to the same month in 2023. So that's um, the, the picture on Singapore China, China sees um, the slowdown still, um, but it's somewhat lesser than what we saw in 2023. Unemployment of youths con continue to be high. FDIs have not quite resumed. Real estate is still in the doldrums. But certain factors, certain sectors like food, industrial, renewables seem promising. Um, People seem to be getting used to the external environment and finding new ways to make things work again. Semicon is resuming hiring, especially in the FEPS, as I mentioned just now, um, because China is now building its ecosystem for internal circulation. We think this market will eventually recover. It's just a matter of time. Um, there is ample resolve that we see at the government level and habituation of a prosperous China to inspire us to hunker down and keep building and rebuilding. Next, I'll talk a little bit about um, Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is relative, relatively stable um, for us because of our focus on tech, which continues to do well. AI is a new spin to the semicon and robotic, robotics cycle. I'll take on the next question. Um, what are you doing about the situation given the sluggish economic situation? Um, the first thing that um, I want to highlight is as a co-owner run company, cost reduction is taken for granted in times like this. Um, one benefit that we have as an organization is that we have an, an auto adjusting performance based mechanism on our payroll cost, um, which typically takes up about 70 or 80% of our operating expenses. Um, our uh, performance-based mechanism is able to weed out non-productive people whose gross profit do not cross three times their payroll costs. Our profit sharing incentives are reduced when the GP is down. There is another element of cost reduction, which is office utilization. We're now on hot desking concept to provide for 100% occupancy where headcount is 120% because there will always be people who are out seeing customers 
clients, uh, candidates, and uh, on regional travel and on leaves and so on. The other thing that we are doing is we're hiring strongly from competitors. Just like our clients, we don't pay to train fresh people in times like this. We are hiring experienced people that are well-trained and can have immediate contribution. Um, nevertheless, we are very careful on the fit to the culture, the enterprising culture that we have. And then there is a third part, which is very important from a long-term perspective that we must continue to upskill our people. We sharpen our skills. The use of AI, I see one of the questions mentioning the, the use of AI, chat GPT, that's taken for granted. Um, it is a tool for us to increase our speed in research and do what the machine, but and our people will fo focus on doing what the machine cannot do, such as sizing up business needs, translating the business needs to talent needs and motivations to profile precisely and concisely. There are three levels of strength. Um, for us internally, we always rank um, our people, whether it's uh, the skills being good or advanced or wow. I would say advanced is not good enough. Either we are a wow or competitors will eat our lunch. I think Jennifer, we have probably time for one more question. Yes. Um, so there is one question that asks, what assurance can you give to investors? Um, to this question, I have four points. The first one is, this is a co-owner run organization. Co-owner operators have been running this business for 32 years. We've gone through six economic crises, emerging stronger and stronger each time. So there's longevity and the experience of going through cycles. Number two, the pivoting ability in terms of the geography, uh, diversity, the sector shifts, the business mix shifts, um, that's between professional recruitment and flexible staffing and the staff deployment. We have that breadth and the flexibility to shift things around according to the business uh, and market condition. The third point is the cash pile. We are debt free and we can withstand shocks we can take advantage of opportunities to expand or acquire. We have a deep moat. And for sure, we will continue to be cash generative, continue to be profitable, and definitely dividend paying. Okay. Um, I think that's all the time that we have for this session. Um, thank you once again, everyone, for spending your morning with us. If you have any other follow-up questions or if you'd like to uh, chat with us a little bit more, feel free to drop us an email at our um, investor relations mailbox. That's ir at hrnetgroup.com. Thank you very thank much. You. Have a thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer, thank you, for the insightful yeah. sessions. Next, we will have a discussion on the analyst take on dividend portfolio with Portugal of Philip Security Research, the life of DBS Bank, and moderated by Hazel Zoon of the Joyful Investor. To watch the discussion, head over to the program tab on the SGGM website and click on the watch live button that is beside the session. So if you encounter any issues, you can refer to the user guide tab on the website for more information. We will see you over at that session. Thank you, everyone.